Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, particular instability over the next uh, 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, so it's going to be more of an uh, overview. Um, I would like to thank uh, Abbas for the invitation uh, and this uh, excellent webinar, which I think is a great initiative, uh, especially from the trainee's point of view. The redislocation rate after the first time, especially from the trainee's point of view. The redislocation rate after the first time patella dislocation is up to 20%. And once the patella has dislocated second time, the redislocation rate can be as high as 71%. Recurrent patella instability is multifactorial, and it is the interplay of all these multiple factors that causes uh, patella instability. And therefore, it is really important to understand the biomechanics of patella mobility, patella stability, and what pathological structures will cause that patella instability, and therefore appropriately treating patella instability. So if you look at the pathobiomechanics of the uh, knee joint in extended position, maximum up to 20 degree flexion, the stability is provided by the soft tissue. The, uh, the medial side, there is a, a dynamic stability of VMO and static stability of MPFL. Now MPFL is a check ring. What it means is that it is not pulling patella medially, but it is stopping the lateral, abdominal lateral displacement of the patella. And MPFL is relatively isometric throughout the range of motion with slightly lax in flexion beyond 20 to 30 degree. The stability of the soft tissue on the lateral side is by the lateral retinoculum. Now, as the knee is going into 20 to 30 degree of the flexion, the stability now is provided by bony stability. And there are two important structures, uh, things to consider. One is patella should be at appropriate height so that it is engaged or captured in normally concave shaped trochlea. So two things important, normal shape of the trochlea and patella at appropriate height to be engaged into that normal patella. Now we publish uh, the methods, uh, various methods of patella height measurement almost 10 years ago. Uh, I won't go through the details of that, but the two methods that I think are clinically relevant and useful to use is cat and disarm ratio, which is the ratio of the patellar articular surface and anterior superior portion of tibial plateau. And if it is more than 1.3, it is abnormal patella height. But I think the one that is most relevant and it is actually reflecting patellofemoral or patellotrochlear joint is the patellotrochlear index. And that is the overlap of the patellar articular surface and trochlear articular surface. And we published this systemic review about patellotrochlear uh, index and articulation. And our own study suggested that that mean PTI value is somewhere between 0.3 to 0.38. In terms of the shape of the trochlea, uh, DJO classification is the most commonly used classification to classify trochlear dysplasia, and essentially it is divided into four types. Understanding crossing sign is important because that is abnormal in each type. And then depending on if there is supratrochlear spur or double contour or both of them, they are divided into A, B, C, and D with increasing severity. The slight problem with this classification is that the inter-observer and intra-observer correlation is not that good and that is universally published. And therefore, I think the new classification, which was in fact presented last year and uh, published this year in JBJS, or specific bristle classification, is really easy to understand and interpret. So it's mild trochlear dysplasia, which is shallow, moderate trochlear dysplasia, which is flat, and severe trochlear dysplasia, which is a convex trochlea. Now, as the patella is going through the rest of the flexion from 20 degree, 30 degree to 80, 90, 100 degree, it is important that it is tracking centrally without any abnormal lateralizing force. And that is dictated locally in the knee joint by the position of the tibial tubercle. And that can be quantified on imaging with a, a superimposed image with TTTG, which is tibial tubercle trochlear groove distance. And if you look at various values in the literature, the cutoff point has been suggested in some as 15, in some as 20. But anything more than 20 is probably abnormal. Now this TTTG value can be affected by many factors and therefore it is important to understand how these factors are affected in the TTTG value that you are reading. 
to negate the effect of TTTG, TTPCL distance was introduced, which is to negate the effect of TTTG and to understand the deviation of the position of the tubal tubercle in relation to TBI itself. And again, looking at the literature, the value that was considered pathologic is anywhere from 20 to 24. The other thing that we need to understand is that when patella is tracking centrally, the abnormality away from the knee joint can also cause lateralizing force. And that is if there is any valgus alignment or if there is a rotational abnormality or the torsional abnormality where there is excessive antiversion of femur. And last but not the least, if there is significant weakness of the hip abductors or the rotator, that can cause relative internal rotation of the femur and patellar instability. If there is torsion abnormality, the first clue that you get on clinical assessment is the squinting patelli, as you see on this uh, on clinical picture, where patelli is inwardly pointed. And if you ask this patient to stand so that the patella is facing forward, you will see the external rotation deformity of both lower limbs. And obviously this needs to be further assessed with the rotational profile. And on imaging, it can be checked as well with superimposed images. In terms of clinical assessment, I'm not going to go through all of this in detail, but the main point to assess is, as I said, look at the squinting patelli, look at the torsional deformity. Is there any obvious varus or valgus deformity? It is important to try and assess the strength of the hip muscles because that is going to be fundamental. If you miss that, even if you do perfect surgery, patient may continue to have symptoms. And it's very simple to do. Ask patient to do single leg squat as best as you can. If possible, they can keep other leg in straight position. Now here you can see that the hip is going in adduction and a little bit of internal rotation, suggestive of some weakness of proximal muscle. Obviously, it is important to assess the tracking of the patella with patients sitting at the edge. And you can see that when there is increasing severity, rather than J tracking, that can be a big clunk as you see here. Now, mediolateral mobility needs to be assessed. And if the patella is more than two quadrant of its thickness, mobile, then it is considered abnormal, both in flexion and extension. The patella tilt needs to be assessed. Uh, and the most important thing not to forget is that, is there any muscle tightness of the cordyceps muscle, hamstring muscle, the calf muscle, and muscle weakness as we discuss. And before you finish the clinical examination, must make sure that the Baton score is not more than five because that indicates the generalized ligamentous laxity that could be contributing to instability. We have looked at all the images, but essentially it's AP lateral and skyline view of X-ray. MRI scan, dynamic MRI scan to assess the physiological loading situation and how it is affecting, affecting the patellofemoral joint. And last but not the least, CT scan for the rotational profile as we just discussed. When it comes to managing patellofemoral instability, again, we must not forget the principle of non-operative treatment, which is useful in non-surgical treatment, as well as in the perioperative period. And that essentially includes stretching, strengthening and use of appropriate braces. When it comes to operative stabilization, the, theme, the three main principles are assessment of the tracking of the patella through supralateral arthroscopy, it is must, correction of maltracking and stabilization of the patellofemoral surgery, and do not treatment, do not forget the treatment of associated cartilage pathology, which is not uncommon, especially with recurrent patellar instability. So let's look at some of the surgical tips. As I said, if you look at, supra, if you look at the patellofemoral joints through the supralateral portal, and in my case, using 70 degree scope, it gives absolutely brilliant visualization of the patellofemoral joint and how patella is tracking and how it is related to trochlea. MPFL reconstruction is the cornerstone of patellofemoral stabilization surgery. The femoral attachment is absolutely vital and if you look at the literature, the one point that is agreed is around 10 millimeter distal to the adductor tubercle when we do a MPFL reconstruction. Now you can either palpate it or you can use intraoperative images. Irrespective, what is important is to make sure that your point is checked for isometry before you create tunnel and do the MPFL reconstruction. 
tuber tubercle osteotomy is essentially used to correct lateralized tubercle and patella halter. And depending on the calculation, you can distalize and medialize, and it is fixed either with screws or combination of plate and screws. When there is significant abnormality of the, um, uh, uh, there is significant patellar instability, as you see in this case, uh, the patella is dislocated laterally, it's not in joint at all. This is in, uh, you know, uh, through the supralateral arthroscopy. You have to combine MPFL and tubal tubercle osteotomy. And you can see that after such procedure, we can get excellent patellar tracking as viewed from the supralateral arthroscopy. Now, sometimes if there is significant varus, uh, valgus deformity or derotation, uh, excessive antiversion of femur, one has to consider derotation osteotomy. This is highly specialized operation and needs to be done in the specialized centers. Trochleoplasty, I think, is a uh, uh, is really useful operation to deal uh, with patellar instability related to trochlear dysplasia. There are two types described. One is dejos sulcus deepening trochleoplasty, and another is a subchondral osteochondral flap thinning deepening trochleoplasty. And that is what I use in my practice. You can see from the lateral side that there is a dysplastic trochlea and the margin is defined, and the trochlear flap is elevated and underlying bone is reshaped to normal trochlea. Um, after that, um, the osteochondral flap is made thin and we make sure that you can fold that osteochondral flip or osteochondral flap over newly formed trochlea. And once it is done, it is fixed with the wire creel tape, which disappears in few weeks time. Don't forget the treatment of cartilage pathology because all these patients will have some degree of cartilage pathology. It can be debrided, or if patient is young, one may have to consider cartilage transplantation. In recurrent patellar instability of long duration, patient may have significant cartilage pathology, and you may have to consider replacing the patellofemoral joint. But do not forget the main principle. One has to realign the patellofemoral joint, and it is not to be forgotten. So the take home message is that one must understand that there is a role of muscle strength and the tightness, and irrespective of whether this is uh, in, in the patellar instability is treated operatively or non-operatively, that needs to be addressed. Understand the anatomic factors and the pathological factors that can contribute to the patellar instability, and make sure that clinically and radiologically they are correlated. The severity of the each factor contributing to the patellar instability is different and different individual, and therefore how you treat patellar instability is quite individualized. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Adil Adjuid, and I'm a consultant knee surgeon at, at Guy's and St. Thomas's in London, uh, and I also work at the Fortis Clinic. Um, I would firstly like to thank my colleague Sanjeev Anand and the organizing committee at the BIOS for their kind invitation uh, to contribute to this afternoon's webinar. Um, and I look forward to sharing some ideas and concepts with you, uh, as well as to some stimulating discussion and debates during our Q&A session. I've been asked to uh, talk on the ACL, which is clearly a subject that's very close to my heart um, uh, and is a very vast subject. Uh, to cover in, in a short amount of time. So I'm hoping to get across some key uh, concepts. This is a video of Michael Owen in the 2006 World Cup suffering his ACL injury. If you focus on the image in, on the bottom left, uh, one can see that the skeleton has been rendered um, utilizing the multiple camera views, and one can see the ACL pivot injury occurring. One can see that the foot is first planted there is then uncontrolled valgus driven by the hip and poor gluteal control with the knee at 30 degrees. And then the tibia rotates internally. Hip valgus, knee at 30, tibial internal rotation and lateral compartment subluxation. So we're gonna be talking a bit about the parts of ACL practice that are hard and the parts that are easy. We'll discuss some of the fundamentals of ACL practice uh, and the importance of peripheral lesions uh, uh, and being very vigilant to identify these prior to surgery. Uh, we'll also discuss some of the issues around timing of surgery. So the ACL um, is conventionally described as being uh, formed of two bundles, uh, both anteromedial and posterolateral, uh, and these are div divided uh, and defined based upon 
their attachment points into the tibial footprint. Um, other concepts have evolved and one that is very popular at the moment is one of the, the ribbon or the band theory in terms of uh, ACL function uh, and architecture. Um, uh, however, we do still uh, speak extensively uh, about bundles. Here one, one can see some histological uh, uh, sections uh, demonstrating the C-shaped cross-sectional uh, profile of the anteromedial bundle with a more diminutive postural bundle sitting beside it. So the function of the ACL is threefold. Fundamentally and primarily, its function is to provide rotational control during pivoting and cutting sports and activity. Um, this is usually in the context of uh, sports engagements, whether that's recreational uh, or professional sports. However, patients can often present with um, functional instability during activities of daily living uh, and domestic activity. The ACL is also uh, critical, critically tasked with protecting the chondral surfaces, menisci and other ligaments from secondary injury. And by virtue of this, uh, also prevents and delays the onset of future arthrosis uh, and potential arthritis. ACL treatment broadly falls into two categories, um, both of which uh, uh, require medical supervision uh, and the diligent uh, clinical care uh, and supervision. One can treat ACL deficient needs non-operatively, often referred to as making the patient a COPA. This involves diligent, uh, uh, well-structured physiotherapy rehabilitation um, combined with activity modification, which usually involves um, uh, no longer engaging in high-risk activity, such as pivoting sports. Alternatively, patients can consider surgery by way of ACL reconstruction. However, it is, it is critical that ACL reconstruction is combined with repair of any concomitant meniscal lesions, the majority of which are usually repairable, as well as addressing any peripheral lesions, and we'll discuss these going forwards. It's very important that when we're counseling our patients that we maintain equipoise um, and essentially sit on the fence, presenting our patients with the pros and cons of both treatment options and supporting their decision making. In terms of running a service, the difficult parts of running a service and the hard parts in terms of setting up a service are establishing uh, a proper MDT working with established well-functioning patient pathways to get both acute and chronic patients into clinic to see the right people. Accurate assessment and counseling of patients is critical um, and close liaison and integrated care with our physio services, um, both to deliver uh, optimized conservative treatment to make patients copers, as well as pre-operative preparation and post-operative rehabilitation. The easy bit uh, of providing care is the surgery. There are some fantastic fellowships nationally and internationally um, where uh, young budding soft tissue knee surgeons can get superb training and there are also uh, numerous excellent cadaveric uh, instructional courses uh, where one can uh, get the surgical skills necessary. ACL surgery fundamentally is about making the diagnosis, excluding peripheral lesions, preparing the patient and their knee for their surgery, harvesting preparing a good quality graft, being a master of your field of view, both in terms of portal placement and visualization as well as fluid management, and being a master of instrument access. So you should never be struggling to access your working area and introduce your instruments. It's also very important to have a good tunnel placement and rehabilitation is critical, um, both rehabilitation of your graft, your knee, and the patient themselves. I would much rather be a very average, mediocre um, uh, soft tissue knee surgeon with superb rehab than to be an outstanding uh, soft tissue knee surgeon with poor rehab. In terms of preparing the patients, it's very important, as I've mentioned, never to try and sell the operation. Um, but, but rather counsel the patient regarding the pros and cons of uh, their treatment options and support their decision making. As well as consenting the patient for the usual risks of surgery and anesthesia, it's very important to consent to your patient every time for your backup graft option, um, which is either an alternate graft, for example, switching from a BTB to a hamstring, or potentially uh, a contralateral graft. It's important that you consent your patients for the risk of um, graft failure in the future and potential revision surgery and the risk of meniscal repair. It's also very important that the patient commits to their post-operative rehabilitation 
um, and is aware that the immediate post-operative rehabilitation may be changed depending upon uh, whether or not they have a meniscal repair or other uh, uh, intervention. Misdiagnosis are uh, also a challenge. And when faced with an ACL deficient knee, it is critical that you go out of your way um, to surveil and look for uh, potential missed lesions, which if missed at index surgery, will significantly predispose to the risk of graft re-rupture by a, at least an order of magnitude. Um, these lesions include meniscal ramp lesions, so posterior medial uh, meniscal capsular tears, as well as meniscal root lesions, um, and the risk of anterolateral corner or posterolateral corner uh, instability and insufficiency. Where these are identified, uh, surgical reconstruction and repair should be planned at the time of index ACL surgery. Other lesions commonly underdiagnosed or underestimated include PCL injuries and MCL injuries. To mitigate the risk of missing lesions, it's very important to have a very meticulous, standardized and methodical way of assessing your patients at index presentation in clinic and documenting your assessment every single time. Um, uh, EUA is also a very valuable tool. Um, An MRI is mandatory, but not infallible. I think some, some of us sometimes risk using MRI as a, um, uh, as a crutch and a support. Uh, and it's important to appreciate that in the vast majority of cases, MRI confirms your clinical uh, 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 diagnosis and assessment um, uh, and is to exclude any occult uh, intraarticular pathology. But for example, MRI is notoriously poor uh, at, um, at uh, judging uh, postural corner uh, uh, chronic insufficiency and instability. Uh, and this really is something that we, we, we need to do clinically. In terms of timing of surgery, uh, surgery can, can potentially uh, be a little too early or too late. While there is a role for acute surgery, um, it's important to appreciate that uh, in the context of acute um, uh, uh, ACL reconstruction, one is asking the patient and the physios to rehabilitate both the index injury with which the patient is still suffering, as well as the surgical insult, which is a second hit. Um, there is a risk of arthrofibrosis and a potential risk of an, un an unhappy, dissatisfied patient despite a stable knee. For this reason, um, uh, in general, I insist on uh, uh, all acute ACLs undergoing a course of prehab, uh, which is appropriate physio rehabilitation with the aim of uh, abolishing uh, and resolving their knee effusion, regaining terminal range, including hyperextension, uh, having good quads activation, and the patient mobilizing without any walking aids and with a normal symmetrical gait. One can also potentially operate too late, and the literature does suggest that uh, the optimal window uh, uh, would be to reconstruct and stabilize the knee within six months of the index injury, and any delay beyond this is associated with an increased prevalence of meniscal pathology and chondral pathology. Of course, this is a challenge in the context of our NHS waiting list, but this is something we continue to struggle with. So to conclude, ACL surgery is about making the diagnosis both of the ACL tear and of any other potential peripheral lesions. It is critical that the patient and the knee are appropriately prepared and consented, um, and that at surgery, we harvest and prepare a really good graft uh, with meticulous harvest technique and graft preparation. It's important to be the master of your field of view and have good access, as well as good tunnel placements. And we then want to rehab the graft, the knee, and the patient. Once again, thank you very much for your time and I look forward to our Q&A session. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation. I will be talking for tibial plateau fractures. I'm going to mainly focus uh, uh, to the fracture patterns, the understanding, the new understanding of those, new surgical approaches that um, we use nowadays uh, to approach these different aspects of the tibial plateau. I will try to illustrate those with some uh, cases and of course touch on principles and basic facts. There are fractures which are rel relatively frequent in high 
um, volume big centers as referrals. They have a bimodal distribution, high and low energy mechanisms. The lateral condyle or lateral plateau is quite commonly affected. Less frequently, the isolated medial condyle injuries, and of course, the higher uh, impact and energy, both condyle fractures in about 30% of, of the overall uh, cohort. The anatomy dictates usually how things evolve. The lateral plateau is a bit more prominent, a bit wider, a bit less covered by the meniscus. Obviously, this explains why they are more frequently injured with valgus forces that lead to the crash and depression and split usually of the lateral plateau. Valgus forces produce a similar phenomenon to the medial plateau. Will staxial compressive forces lead uh, to injuries of both condyles. And we can have, of course, combination of forces. I think it's important the position also of the knee at the time of the injury. As uh, if the knee is in flexion, you could expect posterior shear fragmentation uh, and uh, the anterior elements to be mostly intact. This is another subtype, I believe, that needs attention. Into the initial assessment, the ATLS, it's of paramount importance for the overall assessment of the patient. Of course, we deal locally with the soft tissues, assess the neurovascular status, and the vascularity and nerve supply to the distal extremity, the movie monitor for the compartment syndrome, uh, age, activity level, bone quality, and pre-existing arthritis may push us in a different direction as far as the treatment. And of course, we use uh, imaging, usually a CT scan to plan ahead. And then we wait to resuscitate the soft tissues. And then uh, we need to time well our intervention. And of course, uh, make sure that there is available expertise or else they refer the patient appropriately. Plain x-rays do you, are very useful as an initial tool. Uh, they don't give us all details, but they can hit into the nature of the fracture. A CT scan is usually what follows, that gives us better understanding of the comminution and usually also is helpful to dictate which approach we need to take. MRI sometimes is useful uh, when we do it, uh, it's mostly for SASCAR4 injuries with uh, various mechanisms, uh, lateral or posterolateral uh, ligamentous structures uh, uh, injured. It can give us also information on the meniscus in this case, where you can see it entrapped. Do we do a CT angiogram in all cases? No, we use it usually when we have a clinical suspicion of a, due to a dislocation or signs of ischemia. And of course, we engage with the vascular surgeons as appropriate. The same with the bridging external fixator is not necessary for all cases. For dislocations or open injuries or more complex uh, fragmentation, we may need to align again the leg. The, uh, the leg. However, <clears throat> we need to make sure that our pins are not in overlapping a future internal fixation, which can lead to, to deep infection uh, uh, in the future. As far as fracture patterns, uh, the SASCAR, the AOTA, or the MOOR systems are quite old and useful systems. Mostly the news nowadays is the LUO classification, which is based on CT scans. and gives us a better uh, understanding of the geography of the injury and also allows us to understand which approach uh, would be useful to reduce and fix uh, the fractures. As far as the principles, uh, haven't changed much. And the restoration of mechanical axis, of the joint stability of the condylar width, preserving the meniscus is important, reducing the articular surface, producing an end result with a stable fixation and which allows early motion. And of course, avoiding complications which are usually due to bad timing or bad technique. Our options here is from last year's pre-COVID, what uh, came through our doors, how we managed it. So it has a spectrum from non-op management to total knee, nails, fix circular fixators, and internal plate fixation. Non-op was mostly for non-displaced fractures with good axis or elderly with arthritis. It needs a close follow-up for the first few weeks to make sure that the patient is compliant and the alignment is kept. Early arthroplasty it can be useful, it allows early mobilization and uh, decreases the probability of secondary surgeries in elderly, which are, uh, have severe pre-existing arthritis, or uh, there are complex instabilities that would be best addressed 
with the hinged prosthesis, then uh, the early arthroplasty can be a useful tool. Secure uh, fine, uh, fine wire fixators like Elizaro for PSFs can be also helpful. They are definitely a soft tissue friendly approach. They rely mostly to ligament attacks and percutaneous reduction tools that have some limitations. They cannot address uh, partial articular fractures. And uh, after removal of the fractured union, you have uh, a, a proximal tibia, which is friendly for a future total knee arthroplasty. There are no implants there to hinder your way. However, interarticular uh, reduction is important. It's not easily achieved by ligament attacks or mini invasive tools. And uh, often in complex injuries, they need to bridge the knee. And that obviously negates the early range of motion, which I believe is of paramount importance for the future function. So they are, have some of their own limitations. As far as uh, internal fixation, it is obviously uh, has moved away the new understanding over the last decade from the anterior mainly approaches. Now where they are supplemented by different approaches at the back of the knee. And very commonly we combine these approaches and uh, new implants have also been devised to facilitate fixation in these areas. You can have the patient supine or lateral for the anterior approaches or you can have them uh, in um, a floating supine that facilitates, facilitates a posterior medial and posterior lateral approach at the same time. And uh, you can have, of course, a uh, prone position that you can address better the posterior elements. And then, of course, you can turn the patient around in a combined type of approach for anterior fixation. This is an example with posterior CR elements, a depression at the back has been uh, planned to be addressed with posterior uh, approaches. The authors here used uh, actually three approaches uh, with good, in, uh, obviously, spacing of the incisions and good results. This could happen via the standard dual approach that we usually utilize. More than 15 years now, it has been proven it's safe. As long as you choose the timing, your technique is uh, friendly to the soft tissues, and you have a good spacing between your incisions. So it is uh, quite safe as far as the soft tissues. Um, you can see here the standard anterolateral uh, inverted L or lazy S approach, capsulotomy elevation of the meniscus, as you can see here, the anteromedial approach, and then you can have in a prone position posterolateral or posteromedial approaches uh, with or without the posterolateral <coughs> um, osteotomy of the fibula head that helps the exposure. Uh, or you can have a prone with good exposure, the Lobenhofer approach, uh, which gives you adequate exposure both sides. Or what I prefer in more in less complex cases, the modified weight for a floating supine position. You can have a posterior medial and anterior lateral approach in the same setup. Pure posterior approaches, Carlson or Froch approaches. I will show you the Frost, which I believe is quite useful. This is an example, first a posterior medial floating supine position, two incisions, and these are some cases managed in that fashion. This is a recent publication speaking about the posterior lateral exposure. You can see an example, a patient with pure posterior lateral injury, as evident with the films. Had the lateral positioning, the biceps was used obviously as a landmark of the posterior exposure. Here you can see I'm pointing to the girdy. My thumb is over the head of the fibula. The hemarthrosis is bulging through the capsule. The capsulotal lobotomy there will expose the anterolateral plateau. And to go at the back, you find the biceps. You elevate the biceps. Below that, quite standard, is uh, the peroneal nerve as a finding and after you identify that you protect it and then you work around in windows deflecting the media the lateral gastrocnemius away immediately and you can have the exposure as in this case you can see the exposure of the posterolateral corner a rim plate and one third tubular supplemented by an anterolateral plate and you can have a good end result of reduction and fixation reduction tools the standard ones and then uh, sometimes we use balloon osteoplast, as in this example, to elevate the depression, then the defect is grafted and rafted, 
And uh, another example in a prone position, we can get good visualization, good visualization by rotating the table as well. And then posterior lateral and lateral approach gives you, posterior medial, excuse me, and under lateral approach gives you a good outcome. Similar example done in a floating supine position, first posterior medially, as you can see here, and then a buttressing anterolaterally, and result a few years down the line with no big problems. Another example is a fracture with a tibial tuberosity involvement, the so-called in the past Satsker 7s. Here you have to address this post tuberosity as well. Here it was lagged. First the posterior medial again, and then anterolateral. Then another example, community tuberosity that was buttressed with the one-third tubular. As far as the outcomes, as long as you are reasonable and you don't you know, produce results like that for a simple, relatively simple fracture, you need to be reasonable to how you approach them as far as the fixation as well. Some stiffness, infections, uh, especially if you go in bad timings as published. As far as the long-term arthritis, uh, this is a nice publication that proves that in about uh, 22 years down the line follow-up, a uh, big percentage have uh, post-traumatic arthritis. However, judging from this publication of the National Database of Arthroplasties, a very small percentage of the total knees have a history of, um, uh, of fractures, so post-traumatic elements are minimal. As far as now the summary, uh, evaluation of the patient respect of the soft tissues is quite standard. Reduction uh, is important, restoration of joint stability to allow early motion. These are all the uh, you know, principles. However, things have changed as far as how we understand the fracture patterns and what approaches we utilize to deal with them. Thank you very much for, again, the invitation. I'm open to your questions. Good morning. Mr. Chairman, at the outset, I'd like to thank the Executive Committee of the British Indian Orthopedic Society and both of you for giving me this opportunity to present, uh, to talk to you about balancing on primary totally replacement. I really feel humbled and very honored to be given this privilege. These are my disclosures. I've none related to this talk. Totally replacement has been accepted to be a very good procedure in the management of end-stage osteoarthritis of the knee. We've seen good long-term results. Over the years, most issues have been addressed. And overall, we seem to have a better understanding of total knee replacement as a whole. As a result, the indications have widened. Younger, more active patients are being offered this procedure. We are doing this in increasing numbers. And it is estimated by the year 2030, 3 million of primary total knee replacements will be done across the world. However, the fact remains that only 80% of patients who have a total knee replacement remain satisfied with their procedure. Successful total knee replacement is influenced by a number of factors, ranging from the patient, the surgeon, to the surgery, to the implant, rehabilitation, and complications. We do know that an improperly balanced total knee replacement has an increased risk of complications. There is very often a chance of residual pain, instability, the range of movements are often restricted. It leads to a revision inevitably. There is the comorbidity and problems associated with revision and eventually the cost, the financial impact of, the, of a failed knee replacement. So what is a balanced knee? Babazada in 2017 has probably the only person who's actually defined what a balanced knee is. It should have a reasonably full range of movement, symmetrical in full extension and at 90 degrees of flexion, a correct valgus and varus alignment in both flexion and extension, balanced gaps or well-tracking patella and maximal flexion with the patella reduced with the correct rotational balance. A number of things that needs to be present. So what is the technical goal as far as total knee replacement is concerned? We need to achieve a proper mechanical alignment achieve symmetrical gaps, balance the ligaments in the process, restore the joint line and the normal Q angle. And you will agree that all of them are responsible in actually giving back to the patient a functional 
good knee replacement that they are happy with. Alignment and balance are two things that run together. They are, they are always work together. They are like two peas in a pod to make the, um, to get a good outcome of a knee replacement. So what is alignment? It's very much a relative term. It's the position relative to another. It is defined, but it's very theoretical around theoretical axes, planes and constructs, constructs. And it's also dependent on the alignment of the limb and the alignment of the implant. Balance on the other hand is a reflection of soft tissue tension. You need the correct tension for optimum function. If it is too tight, the range of movements are limited and in effect, you end, as a result, you get increased polyethylene wear. On the other hand, if it is too loose, you have instability, subluxation, and dislocation. A uniform tension around the circumference of the joint in flexion and extension is not possible, and therefore the knee fails. How could you achieve soft tissue balance? It is achieved through the component size by using an appropriate sized implant, placement of the component, alignment of the implants, ensuring that the rotatory alignment is correct. All this leads to proper tibiofemoral balance and a patellofemoral joint balance, which is responsible for good function. The bottom line is balance is the key. So when we look at ligament balancing in particular, we need to appreciate that this needs to be done in both the coronal plane and in the sagittal plane. In the coronal plane, it is the varus and the valgus deformities, and on the sagittal side, the flexion and the extension contractures. When we look at either the coronal or the sagittal plane, a simplistic way of looking at ligament balancing is to look at it on the concave side where the ligament is contracted and therefore the structures need to be released, or on the convex side where the ligaments are essentially stretched and the gap needs to be filled. But particularly in the sagittal plane, we need the rule, the McPherson's rule, is that if the gap is symmetrical and further release is required, the tibia needs to be addressed. If it's asymmetrical, then the femur needs to be addressed. Let's look at individual soft tissue releases. On the varus side, which is most common, the structures that are the deforming forces are the deep and superficial medial collateral ligament, the posterior medial capsule, the pessance rather than insertion, and I've put PCL right at the end because I believe that the PCL should not be touched unless it is absolutely necessary. So something that I call as the internal decompression of the medial collateral ligament, just removing the osteophytes from the femur and the tibia before you do a true medial collateral release. Oftentimes, this is adequate in trying to balance the knee, particularly so now that we are thinking in terms of kinematic alignment of the knee. This is a rather busy slide, and I apologize for that. Stages of what needs to be released in trying to achieve correction for various deformities from grade one to grade four. And I'm, I have borrowed this from Henrik Schroeder-Bosch's uh, um, article on ligament balancing in knee replacement. Valgus deformity is no different. It's the osteophytes, the lateral capsule, the iliotibial band, and the role it plays in flexion and extension, the popliteus tendon, and eventually the lateral collateral ligament. When it comes to soft tissue release of the valgus, it means you need to appreciate whether the deformity is an extension or an inflection because the structures that need to be released depends on that. The role of the PCL again needs to be understood and how releasing that will correct your deformity. It should not be a given. How you actually release the structures, whether it's a subperiosteal release, whether it's spine crusting, elevation, or an epicondylar slide depends on individual experience and what is actually required in that particular case. Flexion deformity is probably seen fairly commonly. The commonest offending uh, structures are the osteophytes and the posterior capsule. You should, one should not re, um, resort to an increased distal femoral cut unless and until every bit has been actually uh, addressed. And one has made sure that it just cannot be corrected without a distal femoral cut. You need to look back and see whether your cut was inadequate in the first place itself. Releasing the heads of the gastrocnemius, and again, the role of the posterior cruciate ligament needs to be appreciated. And these need to be done only as a last resort and perhaps only in severe cases. The role of the capsule in fixed flexion deformity is very important. 
As a routine, the anteromedial capsule is released as part of the exposure, and it does correct to a certain extent. The posterior medial capsule needs to be released if there is persistent varus and a fixed flexion deformity, but this needs to be done only after the posterior osteophytes have been removed, and one could consider the role of a posterior cruciate ligament substituting prosthesis. This brings us to two methods of how we are going to achieve balance, either through method, measured resection or through gap balancing. In measured resection, you essentially address the femur first, you do the bone cuts before balancing, and you use well-defined axes like the trans-epicondylar axis, the posterior condylar axis, and wide side spine. The femoral rotation is potentially easier and more reproducible. The joint line can be easily recreated, but ligament balancing in fixed deformities may be a bit more difficult. On the other hand, when you look at gap balancing, you start with the tibia first. You almost do the ligament release before the cuts. You achieve a correct alignment. If you do the flexion gap first, the tibial cut is extremely critical. A varus cut will lead to an internal rotation of the femur. If on the other hand, you do an extension first, it accommodates the initial releases better. But either way, please remove the osteophytes first. Whether it's gap balancing or measured resection, there are several articles from 2014, 18, and fairly recently in 2019. It does not show a huge difference, but what is required is your expertise. And perhaps I put it to you, the majority of the time we use both procedures. Should it be a limb alignment or component alignment? Papers from 2018 by Teeter et al. has said that overall alignment has no influence on tibial loosening. But if the tibial base plate is unvarious, there is a greater risk of failure. I'm going to talk briefly on mechanical alignment and kinematic alignment. Mechanical alignment is something that we have always done for years together. That alignment needs to be achieved in both the coronal and the sagittal plane in order to give a stable name with neutral alignment. This is based on Insol's philosophy that by shifting the weight-bearing axis from the medial side to the middle, it would actually regulate the polyethylene wear. It is more biomechanically friendly around the trans epicondylar axis and patellar tracking overall seems to be better. Latterly, however, we've been talking about kinematically aligned totally replacement. It restores the native knee, it promotes physiological kinematics. Implant survival has not been there for that long. It's only up to two to nine year results, but there are better functional outcomes. And I've listed a couple of papers to support that. Should we do a Katka or a Matka? In a paper written by Pandit et al., uh, Hemant Pandit et al., five randomized control trials, several methods of doing the procedure, the risk of loose tibial component in the kinematic alignment has been shown to be less in the mechanical alignment. Alignment and soft tissue tension run hand in hand. The component alignment and soft tissue condition has a significant effect on kinematics and the wear of fixed bearing totally replacements and is something that needs to be kept in mind when we complete the procedure or carry out the procedure. In conclusion, balancing the knee is extremely important, but in order to do that, we need to understand the deforming forces and structures. Alignment and balance run hand in hand and it cannot be forgotten. At the end of the day, patient's expectations is important to address. All said and done, 20% of patients are unhappy after total knee replacement. And it is up to us to ensure that we do everything and strive in every aspect to try and minimize this 20%. Thank you again for the opportunity.